when they give up that precinct station that was burnt to the ground, whatever the number was, let's call it the third precinct, I don't remember, but it was the place from which the officers who were trying to arrest George Floyd had been dispatched. And therefore, the site at which a mob of angry people massed, seeking, I don't know what exactly, the mayor, Jacob Fry, of the city of Minneapolis, directed that that precinct be abandoned by the police officers to that mob. You had thousands of people outside the third precinct. And the likelihood of very serious injury and death was high. That was not a consequence that I could have on my watch. The policemen gathering their precious evidence and other our firearms and other such materials that couldn't be left to a mob are racing out the back of the precinct as the mob is coming in the front door for their lives. The building is burnt to the ground. No National Guard. No effort to draw a line. Who made that decision? Why? Why was that decision made? What does it mean when you allow something like that to happen? This- well, we could begin to parse it. I assume the concern is that if you confront that mob, there are going to be casualties and there's going to be a melee and that's going to be a worse thing. And therefore, the lesser of the evils at hand is to allow them to take over the station. And I guess it's easy for me to sit in my parlor and to second guess that call. But I think history is going to read it as, as a kind of concession that is to be regretted, is emblematic of a more general spinelessness with which a variety of authorities leading all the way up to the presidential candidate and vice presidential candidate of the Democratic Party in the year 2020, to people kneeling with kenty cloth around them, Uh, anyway, I ramble. You don't ramble. It's a month after that mob here in New York, then Mayor Bill de Blasio, had been you know, breaking up Hasidic weddings, et cetera, because of the pandemic, which made sense, but then sanctioned people out on the street, cheek by jowl, chanting about George Floyd, saying that racial issues like that were more important than issues concerning the communication of a disease for which there was then no vaccine. That struck me as medieval. That was one of about five things that made me write woke racism. I thought, this is, this is religion. It might as well be 1250 somewhere in France. This has nothing to do with logic. These people are kneeling at an altar. Very clear with that mayor. <laughs> In Minneapolis, he looks like the actor Paul Sands from from the early 70s. So just the, the saintly air about him. Clearly, he just has a sense of what it is to be a good person. Damn the facts. He fell to his knees weeping at George Floyd's funeral. With his curly locks. Yeah. And he meant this. He had religion. He had religion in him. This really won't do. What are we living in, Glenn? What is this? There are times when I wish I lived either in the deep past or at least 100 years from now. This sucks. People are not going to listen to the facts. George Floyd is going to be seen as this crucial moment on the civil rights timeline when America woke up to certain realities because of the murder of this man. And nothing we say will change anyone's mind. I think it's about way more than George Floyd. I think George Floyd is not alone. I think the streets of American cities are full of George Floyds. I, I think that the, the problem uh, is a lot harder than there's a bunch of racist cops and we need to root them out by getting rid of qualified immunity and making sure that they lose their pensions. Um, and, and I think that uh, the uh, 
papering over of the of the real problem. What do I mean by the real problem? The disorder engendered by the misbehavior, sometimes vicious, of too many people in our midst who have not developed their capacities of conduct and performance in society to a level where they don't constitute menaces to those who are around them. The existence of which necessitates uh, the the use of police officers to uh, maintain order uh, and to create an environment in which there's somebody to call when that guy is in your face. That's the problem. There's a racial dimension to that problem. It's not structural racism 2.0. It's a lot more complicated and a lot more painful to confront than that. Some of it has to do with the internal dynamic of culture and social organization within African-American society. The charade of a gold casket pulled by a caisson to bury this miscreant and the concentration of the aspirations, the political aspirations, the claim on public attention of Black people around that to the exclusion of actually confronting the root of the rot that produced that is a historic mistake of unimaginable proportion. We're going into the second quarter of the 21st century. And Oakland, St. Louis, New Orleans, Houston, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Cleveland, et cetera, uh, are still confronting this problem. Now, if you think abolishing the police is a solution to this problem, you got your head up your ass. You're not a serious person. So this is not just about George Floyd. It's time to call the whole thing off, this charade. And Obama should have done it. Obama and Eric Holder should have begun a process of reversing this moral panic. Instead, they, they fostered it. I agree with you on that now. You're right. Those two men should have spoken truth to us in clear language repeatedly at that time. When I was living through that time, I didn't see that. But yeah, you're right. That was a missed opportunity. And I would also add this. When we talk about we or we talk about the Black community, I think it I don't know how you feel about this, Glenn, but we're not talking about these quote unquote black leaders. It's not about what Al Sharpton should be saying or anything like that these days. And maybe it's just because I wear cardigans. I think it's writers. I think it's the media that needs to take responsibility. It's the people who really shape thought. It's not Jesse Jackson anymore. It's people like, you know, ta Coates and you know, Michael Eric Dyson and... And Jelani Cobb, who's dean and, of your university school of journalism. Yeah, Jelani, Jel, Jelani Cobb. It's people like that who I think... Charles Blow, who writes at your newspaper. All of those people, I think, are responsible for, I would have to gently say, being more open to the reality of these things and a genuine progressivism. I would at least hope that that could be true. Those are the leaders. They are the leaders today. To change thought, to change what we do, it's the writerly class who are online and who, who are heard today in a way that they weren't 50 years ago.